Let's look at optocouplers and photo interrupters to see how they work and to have our thoughts on how we can use them. Let's look at optocouplers first then. An optocoupler at its simplest is a four pin device, two for the input, two for the output. And as you can see, there is no electrical connection between them. Instead, we use light as the means of switching the output. How? Well, we have an LED in the package and a photo transistor. An LED, when it's powered up, will emit light. And on the other side, we have a photo transistor. An ordinary transistor, as you know, normally has a third pin, which is used to change the state of the output. A photo transistor, on the other hand, is a only requires two pins and uses the light source to change the state of the output. So, we apply power to the LED, the LED lights up. As a consequence, there's a change of state on the output. Let's look at a simple demonstration of this. Right, a very basic demonstration, battery, LED with its dropper, brings the light on, but in series with it I've placed a photo transistor. And on this side I've got the basic pocket money kit for the laser totty, you break the beam the light comes on, I've extended it out to here for the test. If I put the two of these close together, then the light comes on here when I break the beam. There's no electrical contact between the two, it's purely to do with the light between the two. So how do we connect up the optocoupler in practice? Well here we are. The LED part requires its usual dropper. And we have a load resistor on the output. So if this pulse goes low, the LED illuminates and this point here will also drop low. In other words, the output here follows the input. The input's high, output's high. Input's low, output is low. But if we put the load here instead, then a low on the input will result on a high in the output. It all depends on what use you have for the pulse coming out. Immediately you can see a difference that the input side here is working at 5 volts, whereas the output side is working at 12 volts, or 15 or 20, whatever. So that's how, at its simplest, we can use them. One benefit of optocouplers is in noise reduction. Noise on a signal caused by well, crosstalk or electromagnetic or RF interference, such that you get the the expected, the wanted pulses, but in between you're getting extraneous pulses, that you unwanted. And what you don't want is the equipment that this is connected to 
being triggered by these pulses. But if we pass them through an opto isolator, you can see what happens now. Because the LED won't start to illuminate till maybe 2.5 to 3 volts, as shown here, then the LED only illuminates during these bursts here. So the output is now clean. There has been some discussion on the MERG forums about interference affecting the operation of servos where you have long runs between the controller and the servo itself. We're not talking about the, the kick that you get when you first power up, but rather interference from, say, a commutation or DCC signals, C bus signals, any interference affecting the performance. A clean set of pulses leave the servo controller, but along the way, commutation or whatever can add extra pulses. And we want to avoid those extra pulses making the servo jitter. And Dave McCabe came up with this. The left hand side is the connection going to the servo controller. The right hand side is the connection to the servo itself. And this piece here is a long run. And these pieces here are sighted as close to the servo as possible. So once again, any extraneous pulses will be filtered out through the optocoupler. That's a common use for it, for noise reduction in signals, but probably be more concerned with the electrical isolation properties. Let's have a look at that then. As we saw earlier, the input and output can work at entirely different voltages. And that means, if we wish, we can have a low voltage input driving a high voltage output, or high voltage input switching a low voltage output. And we'll look at both of these. But what do they look like in practice? Well, here is a pretty standard optocoupler. As you saw earlier, two pins for the input, two pins for the output. And isolation between the input and the output of the order of 5,300 volts. So if you're not running your layout at more than 5,300 volts, you've got no worries in using these. It's a standard single phototransistor that's used for the output switching. You can also buy one called a Darlington photocoupler. As you'll see in this circuit here, inside, there are in fact two transistors. The phototransistor then drives a further transistor to amplify the changes even further. The extra high gain means it's greater sensitivity, so the switching from one state to the other is faster. Or well, there's this version, where inside the input there are two LEDs, reverse wired. So the polarity can be either way around and we'll still get an output. But as you can see, the output from them typically is very low, 50 milliamps in this case. As you can see, the four pin is tiny, 
you can get another version which is simply four of these in the one case. So if you've a need for it, it's a tidier way to use it rather than four separate optocouplers. And finally, there's high speed optocouplers where you're having to pass signals at fast rates. We'll have a look at that later. Let's look now at an example of interfacing a low voltage input to a high voltage on the output. Here we have an opto isolator output feeding into a transistor to drive a 12 volt relay. If we wished, we could replace the relay with a motor, probably driven from a replacement of the BC547 with a higher power transistor. And that will work regardless of the voltage on the input side of the opto isolator. Alternatively, the output could feed into those relay modules that are easily available. Have a look at this. And here we have your standard LDR detector and a perfectly ordinary relay module driving a motor and in between you can see the optical isolator with the resistors. Put the power on. The train comes into the yard. The motor could be organised in the conveyor belt or whatever. And as long as you block the light, the motor will operate. Doesn't matter. That could be a 24 volt motor, 9 volt motor, 6 volt, doesn't matter. It's independent of the voltage it's going to be on the LDR toddy. For convenience, in this example, I fed both the input and the output from the same voltage source but in practice of course it's more likely to have a lower input voltage on the input for example if you use the, the laser detector instead of the LDR if you use the current detector it would be 5 volts in both cases getting switched from their outputs and look at this too Many of us are using microprocessors and their outputs, dependent on the model we choose, the PIC, Arduino or a Pi Pico, etc., is liable to be either a 5 volt output or a 3.3 volt output. Whereas motors and lead strips and so on tend to operate at 12 volts. So we're using the opto isolator to switch 3.3 or 5 volt changes into 12 volt changes on the output. Now, as I said earlier, we're not always interfacing low voltages to higher voltages. Quite often, the other way around, we're interfacing high voltages to lower voltage devices as a means of preventing the lower voltage devices being damaged by the higher voltages. Let's have a look at an example. Here is our own pocket money kit number 7, the DCC detector circuit. When a train comes into a section of track, this circuit spots the, the current draw and switches on the lead inside the optocoupler. So although the DCC itself might be operating at 15 volts or 18 volts or whatever, the output from the optocoupler can be happily 
connected to devices that operate at 3.3 or 5 volt working, preventing any possible damage. Here's another example. The LDR Totti is working at 12 volts, but we connect it through an optocoupler such that it's quite happily triggering an input of an Arduino Nano that's operating at 3.3 volts. Some time ago I was approached by a member who had a problem with his solenoid operated points. He wanted to be able to have indicator lights on his control panel which showed which way the points were set. An easy task when you're using uh, stall motors or servo operated motors, but a problem with solenoids because A, they're high voltage and B, they're momentary. You're either using a, a prod and stud or you're using a push button or a passing switch. Therefore, there, there's no constant on, constant off state. It's only a pulse. So how do we solve that? Well, if you've been to one of our workshops on electronics, we covered the 555 and its various modes of operation. And one of them was bistable, where the output can change state from two different inputs. One that will make it go high, one that will make it go low. And that's the technique we used in the circuit here. Here is the schematic I came up with. The output of the 555, when it goes low, brings on this top lead. When pin 3 goes high, it brings on the bottom lead. The state of pin 3 is determined on what pulse comes in on pins 4 and 2. And these two inputs come from two opto-isolators, each one across the coil. So when you put a pulse, a high voltage pulse, across coil A, it brings on the lead inside the opto-isolator and a even if it's only a, a pulse, it's all we require to trigger the 555. And similarly, when a pulse goes across coil B, it triggers the lower up to isolator. And that brings on pin 2 for a period, once again switching output 3. Let's look at it. In practice. Here's the gauge master capacitor discharge unit with a high voltage supply, standard SIP motor for solenoids. There's a little module with its LEDs. First, my 9 volt battery it would normally be the 12 volt bus on your layout. When you press the button, not only does the solenoid change, but the light tells you which way it has gone. Right, a couple of more applications for opto couplers. This one shows a VCC decoder output, could be a, a function output or whatever, triggering at a, a higher voltage than this end. We've got a 5 volt regulator, but it's getting its power from the DCC down to 5 volts. 
and any gadget here then can be triggered from the function output of your DCC decoder. In this case, I'm showing a sound player that plays a single sound when you, you hit the function key. But it could be a servo that's been used for a recovery crane or making the driver's head pop out the window or whatever. And then I came across this article on the internet from Rudy's Model Railway, a DCC sniffer, which interfaces between your track and your computer. And in that way, your computer monitor will display what commands are currently being sent out by your DCC controller. And I thought that would be a handy one to amend. To not have it tied to your computer, but having it handheld. Either with uh, clips or with prods that you can attach to various parts of your layout to check the quality of your DCC signal. Battery powered, maybe an OLED screen rather than but of course DCC is fairly high frequency and I found that if I used one of the ordinary optocouplers it wasn't up to the job. I had to use one that I mentioned earlier which is the high frequency version. Here we see the 6N137 still an optocoupler but can handle changes up to 100 megahertz. So you connect your DCC in at one end and take your output end to a microprocessor, whatever you, you're using. Before we leave optocouplers, let's look at solid state relays. You may just have thought that they are relays with no moving parts. You may have wondered at why a, such a low input voltage can handle such high voltages and currents. But in fact, solid state relays are really just optocouple devices. They come in two flavours. There's a DC solid state relay where you have the lead phototransistor combination feeding into a large power transistor. Something we mentioned earlier, but, but all in the one package. Or there are AC solid state relays designed to switch main supplies. In that case, the internal phototransistor connects to a triac inside the SSR. Solid state relays come in a range of sizes. Also, some are able to handle DC as this one here. And some are designed for handling AC as you'll see in a moment. This particular monster can switch any kind of input voltage between 3 and 32, so very handy for both our 3.3 volt working, 5 volt working, 12 volt working. All will switch this with a very low current. And the two output terminals here can switch anything between 5 and 60 volts up to 25 amps. Since the input side of an optocoupler is basically an LED, then as you can see, the input current is very small. If you're 
try getting it from a microprocessor at 3.3 volts only consumes 7 milliamps on the input side and even at 12 volts it's only 15 milliamps for that particular model. But what about the AC versions? The AC version, very similar, an LED, instead of a phototransistor, we've got an optotriac, a triac being a device that passes current in both directions. The symbol looks like two diodes reverse wired to each other, don't they? And when light falls upon it, it can pass current in either direction, so it's ideal for AC operation. And the triac would be connected normally to another triac. So the, the low current version that, that is photosensitive will then feed to a high power triac inside the, the SSR. And that can switch an AC load such as a light or a, a fan or any kind of AC motor. The snubber sometimes appears built in. It's there just to absorb any fast voltage transients, any sudden rises that might upset the operation and false triggering of the triac. A gentleman called Rev K saved me the trouble and dismantled a solid state really. Better he break his than me is my motto. As you can see there's the triac, the main power triac there and there's another triac on the board. Another way of getting electrical isolation you probably see there's a slot cut on the PCB there, another one you can just see there. So they're providing extra isolation between the high voltage sections of the board and the low voltage sections of the board for safety reasons. That's what it looks like. Let's have a look at one operating. Here we have a solid state relay. Mains coming in through the relay to the bulb and 5 volts to activate the relay. Get the 5 volts connected to the laser totty again. Break the beam while switching the mains. We're just switching 5 volts at that end and achieving mains to the bulb or any other mains device. Right, that's all I have to say on optocouplers. I should mention before I leave it, there's optocouplers and optoisolators. They tend to be used interchangeably. An optoisolator works in the exact same way as an optocoupler, but it's designed for much higher voltages. An optocoupler, as you saw, maybe 5,000 volts uh, separation between the input and the output. Opto isolators used in industry may have 50,000 volts separation between the input and the output. Otherwise, they work in exactly the same way. So now it's time to have a look at photo interrupters. Similar in a way to optocouplers, in that you've got a light source and a photosensitive device built into the one case. The difference is that normally with an optocoupler the LED is not illuminated until you apply power to it and the change of light switches the output. As you can see here in this case the LED and its phototransistor 
are in the one case but, but separated by an air gap and the lead is on constantly and it's whether you break the beam going from the light source to the photosensitive source that determines whether the output changes. It's in the one body, there's no physical contact, it's not like a micro switch, it's purely breaking a beam of light that's jumping across an air gap and commonly used to sense in machinery and moving parts when a particular physical point has been reached. They come in different sizes, that's a typical set. Four pin again. And that's what they look like. You have the gap between them, the light goes across the gap between the lead source and the phototransistor. So normally there is no output, but if you break the beam, the output switches on. Beam, zero, break the beam, five volts. Zero, five, just by breaking the beam. Another version uses a wheel with slots round the disc. And as the disc spins, it keeps on allowing the light through, then blocking it, letting it through and blocking it. And the result is you get a series of pulses as the output. Now we know how many slots make up one revolution of the disc and therefore we can count the pulses to determine how many times the disc has spun round. And from that we can work out the amount of movement. Some of you may remember the old mouse the old tight mouse that had a rubber ball. Let's look inside it a bit more. Here is the old style Microsoft mouse with the rubber ball. Here we have the photo interrupter, another one here and then a slotted disc here and here, mechanically linked to rollers on the rubber ball. So if I move the mouse in one direction, you'll see the disc spinning. The other direction, the other one spins. If I move diagonally, both spin. And here we have the basis of a robot, a wheel driven by a DC motor, a slotted disc attached to the wheel shaft that rotates through a photo interrupter. By counting the number of pulses we can determine how far this rot has rotated and by counting the time between pulses we can tell the speed that it's moving. If you need more accuracy, you need more slots, as you see on the left-hand side here. But that would become too fragile to be mechanical slots generally. So what you have is a printed plastic disc, so the light can shine through where it has not been overprinted. Now. Not all encoders use a rotary disc. You can also get them as strips, commonly used now in printers and uh, scanners. Have a little bit closer look. You can just see there 
the individual bands. And then you see it fitted on an actual printer. In fact, that YouTube link is well worth a watch. It shows it in operation and explains it in further detail for those that are interested. You will note that with the disc system, the disc spins and the photo interrupter is static. In this case, however, the tape is static and the photo interrupter is mounted on the carriage that's going back and forth. Now, before we finish, just two more model railway orientated applications. Let's look at these tiny photo interrupters. As you can see, they're about what, 5mm by 5mm by 2.5mm. Tiny. And therefore able to be easily sighted either side of a points tie bar without being in any way too obvious. Easily covered up with a little bit of scenery, grass or whatever. And non-contact. They don't have any effect on the physical operation of the points tie bar as would happen with, say, uh, micro switches. So there we have them. They're small enough to sit either side and the tie bar. And as the tie bar is moved, From one position to the other, either one of the photo interrupters is activated or the other. And we can use these for feeding into circuits for frog switching or for feedback to your control panel or for giving information to automation systems to indicate that the point has successfully moved over or maybe for lighting, signal lighting or whatever. Here's an example with a Hornby double O point and you can see just how small that photo interrupter is. And if I move the tie bar back and forth when they break the beam it's detected another option if you don't want to have those small ones either side of the tie bar is have it underneath the layout and have piano wire that's operating the, the point tie bar have a piece on it that will activate two of the photo interrupters. As you can see, it's a very low component count. Apart from the photo interrupter, there are just two resistors. One which is the dropper for the lead and the other is the load on the output. And the output can be used to illuminate LEDs on a control panel for example or the output can be fed into an input module of Easy Bus or, or C Bus or a sequencer or whatever you require. And finally I mentioned earlier that photo interrupters are commonly used in industry to limit the vertical or horizontal movement of objects to prevent them overrunning and we can use that to good effect in model railways for example John 
I spelt his mine and you can see that the the shaft has cages that go up and down that are motorised and also a rake of wagons that traverse back and forward inside the mine itself. In both these cases they're using uh, motors that potentially could damage the 3D printed parts by going past where they should go and therefore one method there would be to use limit switches that would detect when the shaft had gone high enough or low enough and would detect when the rake of wagons had reached the left hand side or the right hand side and stop the motor in time to prevent any damage. And that, folks, is the review of optocouplers and photo interrupters. Are there any questions, comments, or suggestions? Thanks.